Well, thank you guys all so much for joining us here in the groom's room. This is the newest podcast from Best Made Videos. No, I'm kidding. This is Best Made Weddings, but this will be Alan and I's new venture coming up, the groom's room. We don't know what that is yet, but that's going to be the next podcast. So thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, we're talking about wedding toasts, do's and don'ts today. This kind of spurred from, I think, one of the conversations Alan and Irene and I were having with Rebecca about wedding timeline. Sorry, Greg, you weren't on that one, but we we... We're talking about wedding toast and reception things, and we thought, you know, that that, that would be a, a really great kind of standalone episode. I have my own story just from a couple of weeks ago with toast. So we're going to be talking about wedding toast, do's and don'ts today, both from like a couple that's planning the wedding, and then also if you are asked to toast at a wedding, what are some things you should keep in mind? So we have two DJs that I'm sure are well equipped to talk about that, as well as a photographer that has photographed, I'm sure, many uh, many a wedding uh, reception toast. So thank you guys all so much. Uh, why don't we start with you, Greg? Can you please? introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is Greg Ladder with uh, Affairs to Remember Entertainment, and I am a wedding MC and desk jockey. And Irene, thanks for coming back on again. Who are you? Hi, I'm Irene Jones. I own IJ Photo, and I'm just happy to learn all of the things today from these cool DJs. <laughs> and Alan, with his new snazzy microphone, he's not wearing his XFL Marcash shirt today, but I've been promised that's coming up soon. Why don't you introduce yourself? coming up very soon. Uh, Alan Chitlick is my name. Puget Sound DJ is my company. And Alan and I are, are planning a takeover podcast where Alan is actually going to be taking over the podcast. Well, we can say that. We don't have to say what it's about, but we can say that it's a takeover podcast is coming and uh, it's going to be a good one. So we're excited. So thank you guys all so much. Um, so wh where do we start here? I think, I think we started... If I'm remembering the conversation, we were talking about wedding receptions, trying to figure out the timing, how long should they go, you know, when, how long do people dance? And we had a wedding a couple of weeks ago and it was kind of casual. It was kind of the, the COVID wedding thing and, you know, a little more casual. And we ended up toasting for like an hour and 10 minutes, which was just kind of way too long for not only the vendors, but like just kind of everybody there. It just kind of was like this huge, like lump of, you know, uh, you're trying to process everything while we're going through all this. So I think that's kind of what we, we were talking about, you know, what's the right times for toast? What's everything else? So Alan, this was kind of your, a little bit of your brainchild here. Where do you want to start? Where do you think we should start the conversation today? Well, I think we can just go around a little bit and talk about some of the things that we have seen that have made toasts be effective mm -hmm. and some that have caused them to drag. And for me, other than the ceremony, the toasts are maybe the most emotional, personal section of a wedding day. I, I just feel like it's an opportunity for the people who really love and care about a couple to express that and say why. And so I'm very committed to trying to make sure that that's successful, that the the people who are giving toasts are put in a position to succeed, that the guests hear everything, that it's well documented for the videographers and photographers uh, who can capture all the content and all the emotions. So I, I think for me, that's sort of the framework where I, where I think about some of this stuff. How about timing of that, Alan? What, I mean, this year, COVID, it's a little bit different, I think, as far as that goes, but let's say in the past or when things get back to whatever the new normal is, what do you think, uh, what do you like for, for the timing, when to do the toast? So, uh, great question. Um, I, I like to try to build an emotional arc after dinner. So any of the activities like a shoe game or anything like that, that are just sort of comic relief. And then I, uh, prefer to, I would suggest cake, and then I would go to toast because for me, that really builds up in emotion and it builds the, the point where, gosh, uh, I, I, want, I want everybody to be paying attention and, and listening and taking this in. Um, and the one thing that I absolutely cringe when I even think about it is having toasts during the meal. Like I want them to be... Uh, I want everything to be quiet in the room. I don't want there to be the slicing and the clinging of plates. And I don't really like it when the caterers are trying to bust the tables. Yeah. 
Uh, what do you think, Time Wise? Do you know anybody that could edit this video so we could get that part out of here? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're back. I was having a little audio issue that was very weird. I think if people watching the video version could see my the panic in my face with Irene while Craig and Alan were talking about toast. Uh, so continue the conversation. I think first off, it would be valuable to talk. Alan, I think, did a good job of this. What is the role of the toast at a wedding? I think some people think it's like an obligation or it's an honor. It's a thing. What, Greg, from your mind, what is the role of a wedding toast at a wedding? Yeah, I think Alan said a good part about the the emotion of it. Um, it I think that, that, that the people that you ask to toast take it as seriously as the couple who asked them to toast, if that makes sense. When we get the uh, the couple who says, you know, oh, you know, we're doing our final planning meeting, I should probably ask somebody to to stand up and give a toast. Odds are that, that the toasts are probably not going to be as uh, heartfelt and um, memorable as, as the ones where the best man is emailing me nine months before the wedding to see how I can help him with the toast. Or I'm emailing him. Um, so, and, and, and I'm not saying either one of those is a bad or a good thing. You know, we've seen people put a lot of effort into ones that, um, you know, they thought was funny. It was too full of inside jokes and things like that. Um, I'd say in addition to that, it's scheduling them. You know, you could, you could have as few as, you know, one toast to as many as, uh, you know, besides everybody toasting, like you were talking about your one a few weeks ago. But, uh, you know, even if you just kind of had the wedding party and stuff like that, four or five, six is, is fairly normal. And, and so if you all of a sudden have your, your closer go first, that sucks, man. It, I, there was a video on Facebook going around. I, I watched actually just yesterday that the, the, in the middle of his toast, it was in England, the dad steps out of the room and a video comes on of him going and, uh, getting the bride stuffed animal at her house, all James Bond style. And it's epic and it's great and stuff, but you could tell it was really good. And the video was amazing, but if with a tiny bit more of scripted of how he did it, it would have been that much higher. Cause he kind of just said, you know, Oh, I got to go. And, 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 you know, somebody show him a video, you know, and it's like, there just could have been a little bit better setup. So sometimes that setup for something that in theory could be epic, um, is a, is a payoff. And, and a lot of that comes by talking to us, you know, to make letting the photographer know to where to be and what's coming on. And um, so communication, I guess that's it. And Irene, as someone that, you know, documenting, right, you know, where, where Greg and, and Alan are kind of facilitating the toast, you're focusing more on the emotions and things. What are you, what are you looking for? What is the place of the toast and the weddings in, in your mind? So the toast for me is a recommendation to the guests of why these two people should be together. The chances are the people that are toasting are someone that knows both bride and groom and not every single person that attends the event knows both parties. And so you get an opportunity to give a little insight, give a little love and explain like almost to an employer, really, this is why you should hire these people. It's these why these two people should be in love. And if you do your job right, everybody in the audience comes away going, yeah, these two really are made for each other. This is great. I'm so happy I'm here and I'm supporting this. So you have a really important role as a toaster and you should make sure that you do it with style and with grace and authenticity and not necessarily drag the whole thing down. Cause you don't want those guests to go, why am I here? Why am I watching this? Yeah, absolutely. It definitely gets, yeah, there's definitely that fine line. I think we want to figure that out today too, kind of that fine line that you're going to walk. Is it, is it important in your guys' minds? Um, how does that focus go? Cause you get a lot of, you know, people come up, maybe the best man is, is just talking about the groom. You know, they try to kind of segue in, you know, the bride at the end or, or one or the other, you know, it's not all brides, not all grooms, but just, you know, one, one, uh, you know, wedding person or the other, uh, do, do they need to know both? Like Irene said, is that helpful? Alan, what do you think w when you're looking for people to toast? That's a great question. I love, uh, asking the couple who do, who, who's on your list. You know, are you going to have parents? Are you going to have people in your wedding party? Or sometimes there's uh, friends that maybe introduce them, but maybe aren't in the wedding party, but have a, a role or a story to tell. Um, and I believe that order really can help um, 
tell that story. In my case, I like to recommend that parents go first because parents tend to speak very broadly. They can speak about the, 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 their child and how they developed, and then they can integrate this new person into that person's story. Um, and as you go along with the peers, they can really kind of zero in on the here and the now, and they probably know more about that relationship uh, even though the parents do, so that the progression of those toasts ends up telling that couple's full story, hopefully, if, if they're done well. Greg was mentioning that too. Dude. So is it almost like uh, kind of like a set lineup for like a band or like you're setting up like an order of, uh, of uh, you know, performers, like, you know, you kind of, you really want to set, have kind of like, you know, your main event. Is that kind of how you look at it too, Greg? I do, but not necessarily. It's not the same week in and week out. You know, it's not always the dad of, you know, traditionally there's kind of some of that stuff, but I think all that's kind of thrown out now about it's more who does the tradition is more still who speaks, not necessarily the order. Um, so really you can kind of talk about that. And, you know, if you've got a one set of parents who, who doesn't know the bride or the groom because, you know, they're on the East coast and, you know, haven't spent a lot of time with them, then maybe you don't get that broad aspect of it. Like Alan was talking about, but the parents that are here do, but then the parents that, you know, maybe you went to visit a couple of times. So they have some very specific, um, uh, you know, story. So if they do, then let them maybe go first. And then, you know, kind of like Alan said, build up to that thing. And, and, um, and then I, I don't know about you guys, but I always like the, the, the bride and, or the groom to, to go last and, and nine out of 10 times. The reason being, um, is that I, I want them to close so that we don't get just unknown stragglers to go up at the end. Um, you know, once not too many people are going to have the uh, guts to go and speak after the bride and groom. I've seen it. I'm sure you guys oh, have seen it. it. <laughs> so do you think I, I, I have a solution to that? First of all, I just don't believe in an open mic, um, y you know, because the, for, for many reasons. But one of which is the last thing always ends up anyone else, anyone else, Bueller, Bueller. Well, I guess we'll move on now. Um, so if a couple does want to add some spontaneity, what I'll do is make announcements during dinner. If you'd like to give a toast, uh, tonight, please come see me and then I'll put them on the list and then I will make sure I've got their name and I've got their relationship with the couple. And so that I can properly introduce them. And then that whole order still flows. I will, I will say one thing about probably every other year and usually with an older couple, um, second marriage, something like that, maybe a little bit of a smaller wedding. Um, they've, you know, I kind of try to not talk them out of it, but kind of mention like the stuff you said, the reason not to, or some alternatives, but when they kind of say, Hey, we want to open the floor. And then I, I'm working the room, you know, with my microphone, I would say once every other year that I've done it, it has been spectacular. And, you know, so maybe like we're doing it every year and then every other time of that, you know, it, it works really well. And, and what always happens is you get the scheduled people to go first um, and they do well and it's nice. And it's kind of the people that you we've all talked about so far. And then you kind of get the middle people who are um, the ones who, uh, you, you know, they kind of get up and say, well, I don't really have anything to say, but I just want to tell you guys that I love you. You know, and, and, and that's nice, but, you know, we know that, you know, they're there and all that sort of stuff. And then after them, though, you get the people that never would have gotten up. And it could be that because everybody else has, maybe they feel a little bit obligated or it could be that um, they've had enough drinks or whatever. But it's that third tier that have been the most spectacular and literally like like I'm almost crying. And I had one, I was, I'll never forget it. It was at the Edgewater hotel and literally the guy got up and he opened with, you know, Bob and Susie saved my life. That's his opening line. And he proceeded to tell a story about him, you know, hitting the bottom of the barrel and, you know, he didn't have many friends left and they let him stay in their, in their, in their basement. And this guy would have never gotten up, you know, and, and I could tell most people in the room either really knew the story or didn't know anything about it or didn't know him. But man, by the end, you know, everybody's hugging him and, and in a regular time, this guy never would have gotten up, but he really felt like 
you know, this was five years ago and he felt like he owed them his life, literally. So that was a cool payoff. You know, the bride and groom didn't know that, that he was going to say that or get up and stuff. So every once in a while, there's that payoff. It's kind of like, you know, playing a song that never works and every once in a while it'll work, you know, so. Yeah, it, it, it's a tough gamble. Irene, what do you think about the open, the open mic format, like kind of after the set toast go? Uh, well, I have had the opposite experience every time, Greg. Every time there's been an open mic, um, I've had someone get up and recite the lyrics to Gangster's Paradise. <laughs> and you look at you, you look around like, what? <laughs> right. uh, so, yeah, as a photographer, it can be really hard because it's generally with open mic. Those are where you get the wanderers and they start moving around. They start doing something and then they expect me to catch things that I didn't know that was coming. Right. And it is really hard to anticipate the movements of a drunk guy uh, <laughs> and where he's going. Yeah. So I'm don't, generally don't get me not wrong. I'm not recommending it at all. But in that rare time where I'm, my hand is forced a little bit, it, it has about every other time worked. So I, we try to not let it happen most of the time. Yeah, it probably is about the couple more than anything else, right? If you have a certain person that it might just work for, but it's generally like a, a 90-10 rule. <laughs> Well, and sometimes it's a work thing. Like one time the, you know, the boss got up and spoke and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the boss's partner felt like he had to get up and speak. And so that happens sometimes. But I like Alan's rule of, uh, or, or guidance of, of asking people to come up and sign up. It's kind of like karaoke. I like that too. I like knowing and being able to participate because part of it is, is just the logistics too. And I want to get into more of this about, you know, kind of recommended number of toasts, you know, how long should a toast go, all those sorts of things. But it's really hard. Yeah. For, you know, if you're a planner, if you're anyone, you know, you're trying to figure out this reception and you're like, well, we're going to do open mic and it could be 45 seconds if one person wants to say something or it could be, I mean, I've seen it get passed around and passed around, you know, and then it's like this endless thing and you're just like, when is this going to, it's just not going to end. You know what I mean? It, and, and so I think, I think it's, it's interesting because at, at that point you really are trying to balance, you know, the, the couple and their wedding and having good things you know said about them, which is obviously awesome. But then you also need to look at kind of like everybody else in the room that, you know, like maybe has no, like, you know, it, you, I'm, I'm always a big proponent of looking at the wedding day first and foremost from the couple, but then also from the people that are at the wedding. And sometimes the open mic, while it might be a rout, you know, riotous, funny time for the couple, it might be a little awkward for, well, I don't know what's going on or I don't know these people or whatever. Uh, one thing I wanted to fi finish our thoughts up before we move on too far, uh, the, the wedding couple speaking, Alan was saying, you know, they, they should always end the toast. Is there ever a rule where the couple should not that. say what? Greg was saying that. You said that too. You said that the couple, is there ever a rule? Is there ever a time when the couple should not say a thank you at their wedding? And why is that always the case that they should always do that? Irene, maybe you go first. Uh, yeah. Well, these people came to celebrate you. They took time out of their weekend. They gave you a whole day um, and they care about you. They brought you gifts too. Like say thanks. Um I, I get embarrassed when couples mention vendors, and I know that that's nice of them. I personally want to hide under the table, though, when they pretend that I exist. <laughs> yeah, they. Um, I would say ninety percent of the time they they um, they do, and then or they and they say they want to from the beginning. The couple does, and then of the remaining ten percent, maybe it's half and half whether they don't or whether they then do the day of feel, you know, somebody's gotten in their ear or they've had a couple of drinks and, you know, I try to talk them into it. If they don't though, I will prep the best man to say something on, you know, something similar to on behalf of the bride and groom, you know, I want to thank you guys for coming, you know, on the East coast, traditionally, a lot of times the couple, when they get introduced, they'll come in and get on the mic and thank everybody right then. So then when it comes to the toast later, they don't necessarily need to say anything. Um, though Alan and I have got a friend who always says, you know, it's a great opportunity for the groom to, to, to talk about his wife. You know, like, hey, doesn't my wife look hot? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a very, very unique opportunity to put yourself out there and, 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 and really, you know, say what you're thinking. 
Alan, why should the couple always say thank you at their wedding? Well, I think just overall, it, it is important to show that gratitude. And as Irene mentioned, people have sacrificed to be there with you. And so you want to show that appreciation. And I believe what Greg was just describing is the time where they can say that and have the maximum effect on the flow of their wedding. So you do this grand entrance, they've come into great fanfare um, and there's a big song and people are hopefully standing and cheering. Uh, to me, that's the best time for one of the members of the couple to say, thanks everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. This is so awesome. Um, and and I, I feel like that is a great transition then to dinner, or whatever is going to come next. Whereas if you just come in and people are screaming and, 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 and shouting and black eyed peas are playing and then you're like, okay, well, here's how we're going to have dinner. And then you turn on Jack Johnson. There's just like no transition there. There's no flow. So that's why I like to have them say thanks early in the evening. I, I shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be lost for the audio only listeners that Alan has a prop microphone as well that he's using when he's, when he's, uh, shall we use it as a transition to where you hold your microphone? Well, yes. that's a good, I want to get into that too. I just, I just want to finish up the, just this one thing. I think it's incredibly important as someone that has traveled, you know, to another state to go to a wedding. They didn't do toasts. I understand that. I understand it in, you know, 2020 and, and things are different and not everybody does everything. And, you know, we did not do a garter toss. I completely understand not wanting to do a variety of things. I think it is is so important that you thank the people that came to your wedding. I, I can't describe enough. And Dorothy will still talk to this day about the wedding that we went to, and they did not thank anybody. And you know, we uh, th there was many other, other issues. They ran out of food, everything else. But but the thing that stuck with us was I thought, man, this is crazy. We just spent a lot of money to come. You know, we traveled, took time off work. You know, hotels and all this stuff. And then to not be thanked for that. I think even if you're shy, even if you're not someone that likes public speaking, the wedding that we had um, the, two weeks ago, you know, that had the, the hour and whatever toast, the groom was not a public speaker, right? He said that, but he still got up and said, you know, I really appreciate everyone being here. You know, thank you for, you know, they had been together for like 10 years beforehand. I mean, but, but I knew that was hard for him, right? Like it was a big ask, you know, big guy, kind of shy, right? And, and I get that, but it, but it means so much more and it'll mean a lot to your guests, you know, even if you are shy of just making that effort. I just wanted to kind of like get that point across before yep. we get on. Uh, so, so when we're trying to figure out number of toasts, you know, we've kind of danced around this a little bit, number of toasts, and then like, you know, how long should each person toast? Um, where, where do we want to start with that? Alan? Or Irene's got it. Yes, please. Yeah, go Irene. Yes. yes. I really can't stand more than a five minute toast just because my attention span's too short. <laughs> and I think most people are that way. You can tell a really good story. You can have an emotional highlight. You can share something that's insightful in five minutes. Yeah. You can do it in three, honestly, if you're good. Um, you definitely can't do it in under one, though. And so when someone gets up and says, hey, I love you guys. This is awesome. Glad to be here and sits down. That's not a toast. So, you know, do a, put a little bit of thought and energy into it. Try to get one, maybe three, five, if you're fantastic, minutes in there. Because, you know, that you're the highlight. You're the entertainment right at that moment. I think that's good. I think people also just have no concept of time. As someone that has... Um, has, you know, I work with people, I, hey, you know, we want this video to be two minutes long or five minutes long or, you know, but just, uh, five minutes is a really, really, really long time. And so, you know, like it is, you know, so, so yes, you should be able to get that across because yeah, if you have this big, long drawn out thing and you're up there for that long, it is a really long time. And it's a long time to ask of people to, you know, that are seeing people they haven't seen or eating or not eating or trying to congregate. And then to put, yes, I think, I think that Alan, what do you think for a timeline? Uh, how, how long is a good speech time? I think three is perfect. Um, and I'm with Irene. I think one's a bit short. Um, I, I have seen longer toasts be successful if they're good, if they're well thought out and the person is speaking articulately and, and has something compelling to say and maybe has good stories. Uh, I, I think I've seen toasts that, that go well. And I have seen toasts that last 
35 or 40 seconds, but they seem uh, like they're lasting all day because they're just so bad. Um, and, you know, you, you want to av avoid that. Like if I'm giving a toast, like, uh, Greg, can we play act for a second? Can you introduce me as a toaster? Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our first toaster of the evening, Mr. Alan Chillick. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, for everybody who doesn't know me, I'm Alan Chitlick. You don't have to do that. You've just been introduced. Um, and I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm not very good at public speaking. Um, I, but, uh, you know, I really felt like I had to do this because I'm the best man. And, you know, so people who go into that without um, a positive attitude, they just lose you pretty quickly and it's hard to recover. So, I think that a rough guideline is probably three minutes is a good toast. Uh, you know, parents, I've seen longer parent speeches. They, they've had a lot of years to think about that speech. So I'll give them five if they need it. I have been planning my oldest son's wedding toast. Not kidding. Since the day he was born, <laughs> I've rewritten it in my head at every wedding while I'm listening to someone give a bad toast, that kid is going to get the world's best toast someday. And it will damn well be under five minutes. And can I get a copy after you're done? Cause yeah. I could use that then. Okay. I mean, go. I'll probably have a copy when I film it, you know, I'm just assuming. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just, no, uh, Greg, what do you think about uh, uh, toast time, time limit? Yeah, I was doing voiceovers this morning, and a, a page of materials at about a minute. So, um, well, at the font size I need to be able to read it. But, um, but yeah, if you think of the screen of your computer, a, a page on on Word is uh, is about a minute. I was I was just under a page, and it was coming up about fifty seconds every time. So, you know, that's a good guidance. You really need more than five pages. Um, it, you know. It, so I, I think you you go with what works and, and people, you know, need to do it. I, I think also, you know, there's a great book called uh, Wedding Toast Made Easy. And uh, it's by a friend of uh, mine named Tom Highback. And Tom is a great, um, he, he used to be the PR person for, a spokesperson for, uh, during the Olympics for, uh, for the Vancouver uh, Tourist Agency up there. And this book, I gave it to my clients for 10 years. And, and it's a lot of good, it's really good stuff. But a lot of stuff it talks about is practice, you know, grab a mirror, sit in front of it, heck, do it on your computer if you want, you know, and, and I mean, nowadays with, with, with video or your phone or whatever, videotape it, lock, look into it, but make sure it's like right now. So you can see yourself as you're doing it. Um, practice holding, uh, Alan's practice microphone and, um, and just see how it sounds. And then, you know, probably ask somebody else's opinion, cut it, cut it as much as you can. And the other thing that we haven't brought up and it's something to think about is, is maybe that person that, um, that either has a little bit too casual of a toast to give for a wedding or that the bride and groom are fearful of that person and what they'll say. And one suggestion I have for, for that person is maybe it's more appropriate for them to give that toast at the rehearsal dinner. And that might be a, a great time to give those inside jokes, um, maybe a little bit more drunken stories, you know, something to embarrass people a little bit. But you start talking about past dating life with either couple, it's not a good thing to bring up at the wedding. No, I think that's a great, I think that's a great idea. And that was something that we, I think, even did at our wedding, you know, because we're talking about this, you know, the right number of people and, and you know, killing the mood isn't the right word, but just, you know, having things ever say they're welcome sometimes. And yeah, if you are, you don't need to have 12 people do toast at your wedding. You know, you can, like Greg said, you, you could do, you know, mom, dad, you know, best man, maid of honor, whatever. And then, yeah, like, I think Dorothy had some of her friends give a, give a speech, you know, at the, re, at the uh, rehearsal dinner, like you said, a, a little more casual. Also, if you have someone that's, that's nervous about giving a toast, yeah. A lot less people, right? A lot less pressure. I mean, I, we didn't even have, you know, they could just even get up, give up and stand it. You know, they don't have to do all the, the with the microphone and stuff if they don't want to at the rehearsal dinner where it is a little more uh, casual. When we're talking about, you know, Greg was talking about, you know, writing things down, practicing. I want to get everyone's take on this. Um, 
do you want to have something really written out? Are we okay with, should people focus on bullet points? Should people, is it okay to read things off your phone nowadays? All these different things, right? Practicing. Okay. Alan's shaking his head. He has thoughts. So let's start there, but do you get what I'm trying to get at? Like if I'm going to get up and give a toast, how prepared should I be? And should I have it scripted, you know, word for word, or, or should we have kind of some general points? What do you guys think, Alan? Well, the first thing, I, I believe that we'll talk about staging uh, at some point today uh, about how the people who are giving toast and the couple are going to be. But in general, I want that emotional connection. If I'm giving a toast, I want that emotional connection. And so uh, it, it certainly, you know, you, you can write it out, you can print it out, you can have it on cards, you can do outline. I think all of those things can work. If you know it and you've gotten it sort of memorized, be able to speak extemporaneously because I can sit here and I can talk to somebody with a piece of paper here and I can still be connecting with them. I can be right there and I can say, Reed, I, I remember when you and I first met at Manisha's wedding and I knew you were going to marry Dorothy, you know? Um, however, if I get on my phone, that's all gone. Like there's just, you, you are getting this phone in your face and you, you lose the emotional connection. I've seen it happen so many times. By the time the wedding day takes place, if somebody who's giving a toast says, oh, I've got it on my phone, there's not much I can do at that point. I just, I roll with it. But if what your goal is, is to achieve some sort of emotional connection with your couple right then, then having it on your phone just is a non-starter for me. Irene, Amen. Is, yeah, Irene is someone that obviously is, is trying to photograph those emotions. What, what do you think about all this? I can't stand watching people trying to juggle a cell phone, a microphone, and a glass. <laughs> you have two hands, three things. There's a problem. Uh, and generally, like people do the thing where their cell phone screen gets dark. So they go, oh, hold on a second. And then they scroll through it for a couple seconds. And that totally loses your momentum and your flow. And pictures look terrible of you standing around holding your phone. We don't know what you're doing. Um, and I can't get any eye contact out of somebody who's toasting. Um, in that three minute period that you're speaking, I really want to get a photo of you laughing and making eye contact with the couple and the couple reacting to what you said, um, whether it be tears or laughter or something, because I want them to be able to see in those two images side by side that there's a relationship that you guys share. And even if the context of exactly what you said is gone in the still image, the emotion still lives on and that's really beautiful. So you have to have that barrier pulled down like Alan was saying, so you can look them in the eyes, so you can speak directly to them so that they can feel that what you say has value. Otherwise, I get photos of the groom looking at the table and he looks bored because he's just waiting for you to finish whatever story you're telling so they can move on to whatever's next and get some cake. <laughs> oh, we've served the cake before the toast, though. So. There we go. So just to play devil's advocate a little bit, I don't necessarily disagree with you guys at all, but, you know, the bride's 22-year-old sister has probably never held a piece of paper in her hand and spoke from it. Well, she's got to learn, man. Yeah. I'm just saying, and she yeah. probably never will. You know, most most college people don't have a printer. Learn how to memorize stuff. They do that in college mm -hmm. still. Maybe, but not virtually. But you know what I mean. I mean, maybe there's other ways around it. Maybe they need a teleprompter. You know, uh, your iPad can work well for that. But I understand what you're saying. An iPad actually works really well. I use that when I do ceremonies, and, and it's kind of cool. Um, but there's still a printed out ceremony script in my you know bag so well but also with the ipad it almost is more like paper it's a little i think the phone thing like you guys are saying i think you do get get really lost in in staring at a phone you're trying to read you know where it is an ipad you can blow it up a little bit you can have it more like you know like greg if you're doing a ceremony you can and still be able to project and look at it right versus being locked into like a phone if that it yeah. is a weird but the, thing but yeah yeah but how do you how do you convince the 22 year old to print something out I, that, I guess that's where I'm going with that. I mean, what we could say is great and might be perfect for the parents and perhaps the bride and groom, or we can offer to do it for them. But, you know, she wrote it last night. So it can, on her phone. she can use the paper she wrote it on. And she wrote it on her phone. No. Voice to text. Dorothy made me because we wrote them. And then I had to, um, like, pen out my, uh, 
you know, the vowels on like a piece of paper. And I was like, I've never written anything so long in years. It was like the most painful thing to try to handwrite that out. I was like, this is brutal. Trying to write it on all the paper and not mess it up so she could have it, you know. It's somewhere. I think, I think you're making a good point though, Greg. Like we are working upstream against a lot of the way society's moving. And that is hard to convince someone to do otherwise. Maybe if we can just have them lower it once in a while, make a little bit of eye contact, come back up for a bullet point, that'd be that'd make me happy. <laughs> so speaking of which, Alan, do you send out anything about toast to the family and friends and bridal party before the weddings? It's on my list to start doing. Yeah, I don't either. I, I, I agree. And it's something that probably... Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I have it half written. I mean, I've gone through and, and taken notes and gone through and done it. But sometimes, you know, it's it's pretty rare uh, if I contact anybody beyond the parents. So, But now we can just point them to this podcast. That's true. So how about microphone? Well, we'll get to, we'll get to that. I, I want to get okay. to that. Yeah, I think... Eh. I think it's a good idea. I mean, and, and I don't know what Irene sends. I know for, you know, video, you know, w when we book, I have a, just a couple little, whatever that stupid thing, you put the photos and the text over it and you can make a little, you know, like an MP4. And I mean, I just, I don't even use like Final Cut, but I just use like this, you know, you can like even text that. But I do think it's good to have like tips for toast or what do you, I mean, I have that, like, what do we need to do for the wedding day? Like, don't worry about it. You know, how do we put the music? Here's your thing. I mean, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to have that. You know, we, we, I have an FAQ video for video stuff. And then I have, um, you know, like a pre-booking, but I think that would be great for DJs to be able to have, you know, tips and tricks, you know, obviously this podcast will be the number one resource, but I do think that would be good. Uh, but, uh, before we get off of this topic, uh, yeah, I think, I think the phone thing has just the, um, People are used to, if people are holding the phone and looking at it, that they're not paying attention, right? Like, I just think that that is ingrained in at least our, all people's age, you know, not the 22 year olds, but that's all in our heads. And I know that like, um, even yesterday I was recording the podcast for the XFL and, uh, Paul, you know, my co-host, like something was going on with this work and he was getting the text, but you know, to me, that's like the most disrespectful thing to be like looking down at the phone. Like we're trying to have a conversation, you know, like we're trying to record the podcast and he's over here. And so I think it's the same thing with toast. Like you see people with a phone, you see him looking down, you assume like Irene said, like, I don't know what they're doing. Like, I don't know what they're, you know, like I assume they're reading this toast, but so, yeah, I think there's just trying to, you know, if you're going to use a phone, you know, don't, don't be glued to it. Try to project a little more, try to have it down a little bit. So like someone like Irene could get a nice photo of that. Cause you do lose that emotion when you're kind of staring at that screen. Uh, you reminded me of a story read. I had a guy a while ago, get a phone call from a solicitor in the middle of a toast. Yeah. Yeah. His ringer was on and everything. So we all heard it. He was like, ah, trying to to turn it off and i'm like how do you fix that paper doesn't have that problem <laughs> we had our our halloween wedding i was live streaming it and they were doing the there was only like 12 people there i mean this was before the obviously the the even we just but they were they were like under the 30 people and the the father of the bride's phone rings middle of the ceremony there's only like you know 15 people and it's like in a bag under this table in the back and so he's got to like get up and like walk back and i mean I think he was like an important business guy or whatever, you know, like the bride was like, well, you know, I'm like, man, this is, it was so bad to like have to get up and do like the walk of shame back. And then all the people are watching on the live stream. Right. And I see him commenting like, what's Lenny doing? Like, well, see, like cause they all know that it's like him happening. It was, it was really bad. Um, so Except Bob on the live stream was a guy calling him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so how, so, so, like six toasts, is that the good number? I mean, I know we talked, so three minutes, right? Less than five. So, you know, three is the middle. Just before we move on, we'll get into mic placement. I know the DJs want to talk about, you know, all these different things. How many people is the right number of people for a toast? That's 18 minutes, 20 minutes. Is that a good number? I'm going to say five. five. Best man, maid of honor, both the parents, both the parents, bride and groom. Alan? Uh, I... I think six feels about right to me. Um, yeah. Irene. Well, it can't be one. That would be weird. So I'm going to go somewhere between six and two. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you got, I think wedding couple, 
you know, best man made of honor and then both parents and then maybe like a, the bestest friend in the world that, you know, couldn't be in the bridal party because they had to fly in the night before, but they've known the couple for 30 years or something. I mean, that's right. I do think like that six is, is a really, is a good number. Okay. Or, or a sibling. Oh, that one, isn't... More, one more quick thing. Yes. Right? I had a wedding a few years back, which was 700 guests and gigantic, like cultural explosion. Um, and they had, they had 30 toasters, yeah. but they were smart and they broke it up into multiple sections. So they would yeah. do like a group of five, then another group of six and then another group of five. So it kind of spaced it through the evening and they coordinated the groups as in like, these are all the bride's friends from these different parts of her life. So it told stories about the bride. Then we talked about the groom, then we had family and it really felt cohesive and I didn't get tired of it. But when they told me that they had 30 <laughs> toasters, I about lost it. <laughs> Well, you also, I, you don't have to edit all that. I mean, I know the folks, like I have to edit, like when it's an hour and 10 minutes of toast, like it's an hour and 10 minutes of, like there's no, oh, we take three hours and then we boil it down to 10 minutes. Like an hour and 10 minutes of toast is still an hour and 10 minutes of toast. <laughs> there's no way, you know, double, double, double cameras. So it's a lot of stuff. Make sure your videographer is happy is the moral of that story. That was the thing on that, not to get on that wedding, but we just, it was like really light coverage all day. And I was like, man, this is going to be really easy. Just, you know, not, not just to be weighed down with all this footage. And it was like thrown out the window. I'm like we're like, we need more memory cards. Like we need more batteries. What's happening. Um, so, so DJs here, it seems like, and obviously photo too, we really want to talk about holding microphones, where to place people, where to do things like that. First off, I think we glossed over this at the beginning, but where should the toast be in the reception? Uh, ideally, uh, all things considered, and maybe we can start with Irene on this one and then circle back around. I know lots of people have strong feelings on this one, but I love my couple to be seated at their head table and, or standing in front of the cake if that's the best spot, whatever's a good vantage point for the couple. And then I want their toaster right next to them so they can have a conversation that we get to be a part of. Yeah, it depends on the room. You know, every I, I there's some place in the room that is our stage, and that that is where we want it to be. If there's multiple places like the head table, the dance floor, that the cake, I almost always leave it up to the photographer and videographer, um, just because of the lighting situation. And you know, I know a lot of DJs are real. You know, it's got to be here. It's got to be here. Nah, nah, I just let them do it. it. Plus, if it ends up the natural place that DJs tend to like it is the middle of a dance floor. But I feel like you're sometimes on an island there and there's no place to set their glass down. There's no, you know, and it's just then in between toasts, it's kind of awkward. Yeah. They got to go like grab there. They're trying to like, Oh, let me go get my drink glass. And then they got, yeah. Yeah. So I'd say seven out of 10 times. I just, you know, we'll talk about it during dinner and with the two of you guys and, and, and try to figure it out, whatever's best. But I, I tend not to have as, as strong a feeling about it, as long as there's not going to be feedback issues. So, Alan, I feel that the best effect is achieved by the couple standing and the people who are giving the toast standing next to them. That way, they're on that same plane. They're on the same level. And if the person giving a toast says something funny, they'll laugh. If they say something emotional, they might cry. I think when the couple is sitting down, you just lose that connection a little bit. Um, and sometimes I've seen couples that stay at their spot at the head table, and then it's kind of like they're just straining their neck for the, mm -hmm. the whole time. So I believe that having everybody standing makes for the best moment, and I believe it also help makes makes for the best documentation. I mean, you can get a, a good video. Irene can get a good shot, like she was describing before, of uh, the person giving a toast, making that couple react, you know, and having all pe all those people in the same frame. Um, in terms of where exactly that is, I think that depends on the venue and what the photographer and videographer envision. It's nice to have a good background, not have exit signs or restroom signs uh, in it. Uh, if I can go behind the head table, that allows the people who are at the head table to see what's going on. Um, if I'm in front of the head table, then the people at the head table are going to see their backsides 
of the couple and the people giving toast. Um, but sometimes that's the way rooms work and you just have to go with what you got. I'll, I will tell you somewhere I've progressed just a little bit. I would say for maybe the, my first 500 weddings, you know, nine out of 10 times we, I was pushing for him to do it at the cake table. And then I distinctly remember a, a, a photographer saying, Oh, well, we got to do toast before the cake because you don't want to have a picture of a half cut cake in the background when you do toast. So now if we, as we've been talking about earlier in the podcast, we, we like to do the toast after the cake. So that kind of rules out the cake table as a good place to do the toast because yeah a, an inside of a cake isn't the prettiest backdrop in the world so it's kind of i mean again it, 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 since then i've kind of progressed into thinking about the other things but it's kind of an interesting little thing that you don't always think about yeah i yeah and i want to touch on that too alan when you're talking about the the different levels i totally agree and especially if like the you know the food is being there or maybe they've dropped off a salad or something the you know they're always like shoveling food in and then all the cutaways or people eating or you know i mean that's it's tough where if they're standing you know they've got their drink and they are kind of pot committed to what's going on and not kind of distracted by what's going on at the table or whatever um yeah, I want. I guess my first question was was going to be placement of like actually placement in the timeline of where we think the toast should be, not placement, physical placement. So we can do that one now. So you think uh, before cake, after cake? You know, we said no dinner. Where, where are we? Where are we putting it in the actual timeline of the events? Where do we think, Greg? You had said after cake, after dinner, after cake. Uh, my thought being that it's kind of nice for. I mean, it's also a, it's a good use of time. And if, cause if we do cake afterwards or they pass cake out, then we've got another 10, 20 minutes perhaps. And again, it depends a little bit on how many toasts we have, but we have, you know, time for them to be doing, you know, it's like we're now, now we're waiting for them to eat cake. So not that, you know, sometimes if people have their cake and they're watching, if it's going to be a long toast, it's kind of a good use of time. You could say the same thing for the first dance later where people are eating their cake during first dance. Um, but I kind of like the toast thing. It's again, it doesn't fit every room and everything, but you know, if we can say dinner's over, let's say they're doing cupcakes instead of cake, you know, they go cut the cake and then we say, invite everybody to come up and get their cupcakes. They sit down and we start the toast. Then people are kind of eating cupcakes as they're watching. And you know, it's not that noisy or anything like that. So that's again, if it has to fit the room and the people, but uh, generally that's kind of efficient. I like it reverse, actually, because I know that there's a lot of grandmas out there that the second that cake's cut, they're out the door and they'll miss the toast if you cut the cake first. And so I I personally like and I know um, it's a good question to ask your caterers because it depends on their staffing. Um, I like it when they do dinner, clean the place, pass out the champagne at the same time, and then they do toasts and then as uh, the toast finish, they walk directly into cake cutting after they do their little thank you. And then they can pass the cake while we're doing dances. You know, I've heard other people say that before. Irene, there was a DJ in town. Um, that was his big thing. And, and he made a huge deal about it years ago. And I just have never found that to be the case. Um, oh, I've seen it so many yeah. times. You got to hang yeah. out with more Mormons. Well, there's... There's uh, yeah, not a lot of drinking at the Mormon weddings. Yeah, we, we only live for sugar. <laughs> uh, I want to get to Alan. I prefer Irene's timeline, but my biggest thing then is the caterer is always rushing in to clear everything during the first dance, and it's always right behind the couple. So while, although I do like that more timeline-wise, then they do need to wait. Like At least we need to get through the first dances, and then you can clear that stuff. I mean, but it, it, right. It, it, anyway, like I read, have you seen that? Like it's always behind like the first dance, and there's always someone like right at the table right behind them cleaning everything out. So while I do like that right. timeline-wise, yeah. Yeah. Uh, luckily, a lot of venues have a separate dance space, which is helpful, mm. um, but it can be tr problematic, especially if you've got a dance floor right next to that head table. Yeah. Alan, what do you think timeline was? I like to get everything else done, then do toasts, get all the guests attention, make, bring out all the emotion. And then that leads so nicely into a first dance. You know, you um, said that in the beginning, Alan, and I, I, I actually like building to that 
and then going to like a shoe game or if we're doing any sort of activity and then roll that into the first dance or bouquet garter toss after that. And again, it's not a rule, so to speak, but it's, you know, just a preferred way and stuff. And I don't know, just different strokes, I guess. Uh, I like the humor. I was going to make a joke. I was going to say thoughts of the shoe game and why we should never do it, but I won't. We don't, I don't know if we have time for that. <laughs> you haven't you should done never it do it me, poorly. Right? I'll agree with you there. You should never what? You've never do done it poorly. It with oh, poorly. Yes, yes. Um, I want to talk about we the the mic thing before we go here. Um, are, you know, are, are we fans of a mic stand? I like a mic stand. That's one less thing they have to hold. We know where the audio is going to be for the video. I know it gets in the way. Photographers hate it. Same way with the ceremony. So uh, let's talk first about mic stands and then mic holding and stuff from the DJs. Irene, do you like a mic stand or not? I don't care for toasting. If you do it during the ceremony, I will yell at you. <laughs> okay, that's a good point. So ceremony is okay or ceremony is not okay. Toasting is okay. Yeah. I agree with that. It's like, then you can like drink thing. Okay. Alan, uh, mic stand or not, or otherwise, what do you do for mic placement? I know this is a big thing for the DJ. So this is your guys' time. Um, I am not a big believer in a mic stand. I do believe that more people can control their volume if they're holding it. I literally go to each person who is giving a toast during dinner and let them hold the mic, let them and, and give them kind of instructions on how close they need to get it. That is roughly 75 to 80 percent effective, uh, 25 or so percent. I'm just going to. Oh, yeah, I really loved. And, and that's torture on a DJ and on a videographer who is trying to capture sound. Um, and to Irene's point earlier, you know, if you've got notes and a drink, uh, yeah, you're right. You're holding those three with two hands. So the answer to that is put your drink down, have that be on some nearby surface, say what you want to say, put your notes down, raise your glass and offer that toast. Yeah. I'll roll a cocktail table out there sometimes if I, if I know we have a fair amount and it's when it, like we were talking about before on the Island in the middle of the dance floor for the toast. And I'll just roll it out there just, just because it should be, but Pre-COVID, I can't even think of the last time I did like scheduled toasts where we had a mic stand. Now, when a couple of times where we've had open ones where they've wanted that, but their compromise was to have it the mic on a stand so people had to physically come up, which is more than you know, so you get less of those, you know, hey, I'm just here because I love you guys, sort of thing. Cause it is it's a little daunting for some people to make that walk. But since COVID mic stand every time then i can clean it and put on the little covers and all that kind of stuff and that might be you know i could see that being a trend for the next couple of years so we we had one where they were uh that they were the bride and groom were passing around the mic and they were spraying the lysol like in, <laughs> into oh. the mic and yeah. I'm like, guys, that's not that's not how it works. You need to sanitize, you know, the handy and you know, have the cover on it. But I do think, right? I mean, I think if you sanitize it afterward, I think you could pass it and sanitize the hand thing. I mean, do you have that cover on it to protect against the saliva getting in there? But is that I don't know, Greg, do you have you have the booties on there? Is that really is that yeah, bad? we so that one I did uh, when things were kind of legal in my first one of the year, July. Uh, we, I literally had it on a stand and I went up with gloves and swapped out the cover and, and wiped it, even though they hadn't touched it for the most part in between. Remember, one guy touched it and I kind of like gave him this dirty look that I realized later was on the uh, video. <laughs> and, and I'm like, you know, but um, and, and since then, I don't, I, you know, it, I don't know. I wrote the I wrote the standards that the state has out there, so you kind of have to uh, be a little bit careful as far as you know. People are talking into it, so I I don't know if I'm more afraid of what they're touching or what they're what they're spitting on. So, um, best case scenario, I would be change the cover in between every person, either if it's on a stand or not, and wipe it down. Hey, so, Reed, are we going to talk content of what you say in your toast? Please do. Can I start? You please do. I'm going to awesome. go. <laughs> Dorothy's coming home. So I'm going to go close the door so she doesn't yell at, you know, like scream happy cheers at Rosie and please continue. I can hear you. 
right? Um, it's really important, I think, that your toast has some highlights that cover the things that you understand about the couple and why you love them. But it shouldn't be these crazy long stories about every interaction that you ever had. Uh, I get really tired of hearing the, this is how I met so-and-so, you know, because I think most of us know a lot of those stories anyways. Um, but I think it's good if you've got a little bit of insight to put those things in there. And I'm, uh, I would love to counsel people to stop telling bathroom jokes about the groom. Like, come on guys, he's an adult. Let's let him have an adult day for one day. Save that like Greg was talking about for the night before your rehearsal dinner and do your potty things then. <laughs> but I mean, be an adult for the three minutes that you're up there. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> um, and it'd be good too, if you do in, in your toast, like you, you share uh, a little bit of why, you know, these people are great for each other. The insight that you have, the reason that you were brought into this, you probably have a unique perspective on who these two people are. Share why their love is special and what it inspires about you. Um, I had a great couple a few years ago that the guy about nine months before they were supposed to get married nearly died in a car accident. And he was in the hospital for several months in a coma and she was by his side the entire way. And when he came out of it, he wasn't really the same guy at first. You know, it takes a while to recover some of that, but he eventually got back to where he was. And so much of it was because that he had people standing by him that loved him and that his wife was right there. And that's the kind of stuff that people want to hear is they want to hear what about them is this great character that really puts them together. And I loved that. Everyone was crying through that entire one. I mean, they all knew his story, but they wanted to hear the story from the perspective of the best friend that watched her friend take care of her husband, you know? So, so bring your unique spin to it in a way that will really share some authenticity. You know, speaking of that, Irene, it I've seen a couple of times and, and if, especially like bridal party where maybe all the bridal party members or the, or all the bridesmaids are going to get up. I had one this year where they all told the same story about the bride meeting the groom, but from each other's perspective. And it was kind of cool. Um, and they kind of, they coordinated it. So the, the point being not necessarily that you have to, you know, all have a, a combined story, but the fact that, that this group of, of ladies, coordinated their story so there wasn't a lot of overlap now they wrote it all together and then kind of did it but i th i like that sort of thing they um it, it, it obviously they put some thought into it and it was very memorable and um you know i i enjoyed it it was fun well isn't that the key like just putting a little bit of thought and energy uh, yeah, a little yeah. thought will go so far in making you a fantastic public speaker yeah and coordination in this yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, if you're going to ask someone, you know, I think we were saying earlier, you know, get like Alan was saying, if people to get up by, well, I don't really have a lot to say or whatever. Like if, if they're asking you to say something, you know, say something at the wedding, you know, try to find something to say. And if you don't, you don't have to say, you know what I mean? Like there's no rule that says, you know, you have to do it or you have to go this long or you have to go whatever. I mean, not you don't have to ask every person in your bridal party to talk, you know, and you don't not everyone that wow, that was really loud. And not everybody that uh you know wants to talk, you know, needs to talk. So sorry, I'm gonna turn that off. That was loud. that sounded like your easy bake oven was ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was like a text message in my bam. Alan, content stuff before we go, we're gonna get ready for the Seahawks game here. Well, uh, two things. I, th I think Irene and Greg have, have had some great ideas there. I would also say that consider your own personality and who you are and have your remarks reflect that. If you are sincere and emotional, don't try and go funny, right? Like mo most people are, are not as funny as they think they are. Um, but if, you're, if, 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 you, if you've got something in your heart that you want to share, do that. Um, but if you are known for being funny, uh, go for it and, and execute it and be funny. Um, so I think that's kind of an important thing. And I, you know, I'm, I'm just with Irene, I think, try to answer the question. Why are you, why are you happy for this couple? Yeah. You no. Know, and, and in your remarks, hopefully you, you do that and that'll be successful. I love that, Alan. Not everyone's as funny as they think they are. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm gonna cross I mean, I am. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, I know how you know that, Alan. <laughs> um, solid, Greg. Solid. Alan, why why should we not ask every person in our our, our bridal party to stock at our wedding? Mm. Well, I, I I think that in general a good maid of honor, a good best man can kind of reflect them as a peer group. And they can say things about that relationship that don't need to be repeated five times. Um, so I think that's one of the ways. And I guess one of the other things I would add is I, I do not encourage couples to force people to speak. Yeah. If you've got somebody who is just really uncomfortable it's not going to be a good toast, right? And just let them be. Let them take the night off. If you want somebody else to take their place or step up in some other way, great, do that. But, you know, if they're that terrified of public speaking, they're going to be kind of miserable until toasts too. Like they're going to be thinking oh, about it. Totally. Nobody really wants that. You know, I've had groomed best men do it two different ways where they spoke as they were representing the bride and the groom. And then I remember last year I had one at the Seattle Tennis Club and the best man spoke as he was representing all of the groomsmen. And I really liked that. So he actually had his written. Then when they all got together, he asked if they wanted to add it. And he put in a few other things that people were in there and they didn't they weren't all like best friends or anything like that. But I kind of like that. That was a cool way of, of thinking about yourself or, or your job. Yeah, I think that's good as opposed to having 14 people toast. I think, yeah, I, I definitely think that you could have a couple of people represent that group, then have 30 seconds from each. And that's the thing, too, is you go, oh, well, everyone's only going to talk for like, you know, whatever. Well, then it's either going to be too short that it's not going to matter, right? Like Irene said to you, it needs to be a little bit of time. But also to do a 45 second toast is like a three minute thing by the time they get, you know, you announce them, they get up, they do it. So it does add all that time up, right? If you're trying to, you know, if you are trying to plan everything and figure out your timeline, Oh, well, we're only going to have, everyone's only going to do, well, it's not really a five minute toast. It's like five minutes and then 45 seconds on the other side, getting people up there and getting it all squared away. So, yeah. Um, anything else before we go? I know there's, I mean, obviously the tons of stuff that we can get into, but any, any huge glaring errors that I've left in, in the, in the holes right now. I, I took some notes here real quick, okay. just to stuff. Um, I think we could do a whole podcast about epic notes or epic toasts. I'm sorry. And, and ones that are over the top, like I was talking about the, the dad being the James Bond, but also if you're in your toast going to be uh, making some pop references, like I had one last year where, where they referenced the groom's supposed favorite song from the, from the eighties or whatever, maybe give me a heads up on that because I would have been happy to have played a clip on it. And, and, you know, I can, I'm quick on them on, on pulling up a song, but I can't do it as you're giving the toast. But I had one a couple of years ago where they talked about how many times they watched top gun. And, you know, I played five seconds of, of, you know, danger zone. So something like that would be, you know, would add to it. And then it, it elevates you as the toaster because it looks like you put a lot of effort into it and stuff. Yet it took us five seconds to, to figure that out. Um, oh, the other thing, and, and I think this is something that 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 sixty percent of the people forget. You're giving a toast, so a bring a glass, and b actually say toast at the end to toast the couple. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've reminded people of that if I can, and 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 I can usually do it for the first few, but you know the once you get the fourth or fifth or sixth pe person, they'll forget, and then. Um, and then when they're done, they're, there's no to the bride and groom or raise your glass or anything like that. So just remember that that is kind of things you want to include. My last thing is smile. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I know that's hard, <laughs> but try once in a while to look up and look pleasant <laughs> during your toast. <laughs> It's so yeah. hard. It's so hard. I just, in my head, while we're talking about all this and cell phones and all, you know, people holding things, I just, in my head, I see these like grand toast photos. They can just be so good and just can capture all of that, you know, every, all the emotions in one frame. I mean, that's why the photographers are so good. And yeah, just trying to, to be happy. And if you are stressful, you know, don't have too much to drink or whatever. Just try to be present for the couple. They really want you to be there and yeah, they're asking you to do it for a reason. Alan, what about you? 
Um, my last issue is about parents. Sometimes I've seen uh, challenging dynamics that couples have about uh, wanting to invite their parents, but they don't want their parents to feel obligated to toast. And uh, at least once a year, I go up to somebody uh, at dinner in, in order to brief them. And I'm like, oh, I'm here to talk about your toast. What? I'm giving a <laughs> toast. And I just, I really, I feel for that parent. I don't think they are then put in a position to succeed. Again, I'll, I'll repeat that observation from before. If a parent doesn't want to speak, don't force them to. But I think most parents should at least be given that opportunity. Um, and then from a staging photographic documentation, documentary standpoint, I think both parents should come up. Even if just one person is giving the toast and one is speaking, that photo of both of you and the couple, I think, is is a good uh, memento of that moment. I agree. Yeah, the parents, I, I know, and this is probably too stuff to get into. I mean, I know there's dynamics asking the parents if if like the couple is paying for their wedding, you know, and, and so there's always some tricky things. But I do think it's it's appropriate to at least – maybe they don't need 10 minutes, but maybe, you know, they still, they're still your parents, you know, even if, cause I've had that dynamic where they're like, the, they're like, well, we're paying for everything. Like we're going to do the big toast. And I definitely understand, but I do think give your parents the option to, to say something, even if you feel like, you know, you're, you're established on your own. Does that make sense? Is that, have you guys, I'm sure have like had that question before I've seen that dynamic. Yeah. I think it just depends on the, what you want. I mean, I, I that, you know, that's kind of brings up an interesting point, Reed. I don't think one toast should affect necessarily affect another. If that seems, if the parents want to talk for five, I mean, maybe from a time sort of frame, if you're worried about that, but it, you, there's no reason that, that if the couples or the parents are going to, the parents are going to talk forever they want, you know, am I'm not going to, um, I, I was just going to say, I'm not going to turn off the microphone, but if you want a really quick story, I will tell you about turning off the microphone on the father of the, of the bride. Okay. I did a wedding um, a couple years ago up at Newcastle and um, uh, they were all uh, native uh, Mandarin speakers. And um, the father of the, the groom gets up and, and speaks and, and gives a long uh, toast and, no, there was not a bit of an emotion for for 20 minutes. There was no laughter. There was no smiling. And I'm not talking just him, but anybody yeah. in the whole room. He just gave a very long speech. And then he finishes, and they give the microphone to the father of the bride. And she, he gets up, and the first thing out of his mouth he has, the room is stitches. I find out later it was because he was insulting the groom. And which, of course, in, in Chinese culture is, is especially bad. Um and then he proceeded to do that for another uh, 35 minutes. And by this time, we are pushing against the uh, sunset, the golden hour at Newcastle, which, of course, was the reason we were all there. And he's going on and on and on. And I'm my eyes are on the groom, the groom. And I'm waiting for him to give me the signal. And finally, the f brother goes up and tries to physically take the microphone from his from the from the dad. Then the groom gives me the signal. I cut it. He never stops talking. It's like this guy waited his entire life for somebody to give him a microphone and he wasn't going to stop. And he kept talking and kept talking. And he spoke for so long. We then said we're going to go do, you know, because the wedding coordinator is freaking out because of sunset. I can see it coming in through the windows. And so everybody gets up, goes outside to do the to, to do sunset pictures. And no one leaves. Every single person comes back in, and we proceeded to do another 30 minutes of toast by the, uh, the wedding party and the bride and groom. The dad talk, the two dads were, were an hour and 15 minutes. Wow. 45 and 30. That's crazy. It was <coughs> crazy, terrible, all at once. Yeah, and don't do epic. that. No. And I didn't understand a single word. <laughs> Uh, well, that's good. Uh, that's a good spot to end on. Uh, any other thoughts? Are we good? Alan, give me a thumbs up. Uh, thank you guys all so much again. I know this is like, you know, probably part one again of, of stuff down the line, but uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I think this will be a fun little, um, you know, not too COVID-y kind of good uh, 
discussion for hopefully the future when people are looking back and planning weddings again and can say, Hey, look, you know, this is how we're going to do the toast. But, uh, thank you guys all so much again, Alan, Greg, and Irene and, uh, go Hawks. Thanks guys. Go Hawks. Woo-woo. Thanks Reed. 